and welcome back. I'm going to start by going over confidence intervals with the demo that I told you yesterday I would try to put together, and then we'll go into the exercise. Okay, so th this is the um, this is the little um, demo I said I would put together yesterday to kind of show an example of what uh, that kind of illustrates what confidence intervals, what their meaning is um, in the frequentist world of probability. So this is done in Excel. Um, we'll post this along with the other spreadsheets we that I demoed yesterday um, on the RMC website. Okay, so how does this uh, this little demo work? So these um, these shaded cells here are um, user inputs. So this demonstration is for a normal distribution, and you can do this with other distributions. Um, two reasons for using the normal one is Excel has all the built-in functions we need uh, to do this demo without having to do any custom functions or coding. And the other thing is um, some of the um, values we need, uh, there's um, analytical equations for them so we don't have to do any kind of higher level uh, methods or any, any difficult math to arrive at them. But the same principle would apply to other same principles of this example would apply to other distributions and other, other situations. So for a normal distribution, it has two parameters, mean and standard deviation. Just to keep it simple, I picked a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one, which is also the standard normal. So those are the population values. So those are what in the frequentist world we would call the, the, the true values of the parameters. Um, N is the sample size, so it's the number of samples or number of data values that we have from the population. And then the confidence interval is, you know, you can choose whatever confidence interval you'd like to like to calculate in this demonstration. I'm going to skip this stuff here in the middle and move over here more to the right-hand side. So this this part over here, and it, it carries off here to the right, um, this is the Monte Carlo part of the analysis. So if you remember from um, previous days, when we talk about the, the formal definition of a confidence interval, um, its definition comes from the idea of repeated sampling or repeating an experiment or repeating a data collection. So we can simulate that um, with the Monte Carlo uh, method. So what we do here is we have, um, going across the top here, we have the number of um, samples, so the sample size of our data set which comes from whatever we choose here for this n value, right? So this, these samples here run from one to n, uh, one to n. Um, and then for each of our Monte Carlo realizations, we are gonna generate um, n random values from our normal distribution. And we're gonna do that using um, inverse transform sampling, which we talked about yesterday. So we do that with, um, since it's a normal distribution, the norm dot inverse. The input's a probability. That probability is the cumulative probability, which we want to be a randomly generated number between zero and one. So the RAND function in Excel does that. And then we reference back to whatever we chose um, over here as our, as our input mean and standard deviation. And then this little if statement here, this is just, just so that you can put in different values for n. So this just checks if the current sample is within the range of the n value you input. And if it is, it does the calculation. If not, it, it leaves the cell blank so that you can vary n if you like to, to if you want to tinker around with the spreadsheet. So in this case, we have n equals 50. So this should carry out, um, should repeat for 50, uh, out to 50 samples. So those are 50 random samples drawn from our normal distribution using inverse transform sampling. Okay, so what we need to do from that is we need to calculate an estimate of um, the mean of the sample mean. So that sounds a little bit odd, but um, what we're interested in or, or what we're doing here in this experiment is looking at, this, at the um, uncertainty distribution for uh, estimate of the sample mean. So, um, 
So, so what we're interested in is what the, what the uncertainty distribution is um, in our estimate of the mean. And we know for, for a normal distribution, and I think I have it called up here. I will pull it over here so you can see it. So two, two nice, easy things we know about the normal distribution that, that make this easy to implement for this demo is we know that um, what, and it's in this first column of this table here, we know what the um, uncertainty distribution is for an estimate of the sample mean. Um, we know that it's a normal distribution, um, and we know that it should have a mean equal to the sample mean, and it should have a standard, uh, or sorry, a variance equal to the, to the um, sample variance divided by the number of data. And so remember, standard deviation is the square root a variance, so it would have a standard deviation equal to the sample standard deviation divided by the square root of n. So we can use those, those, the, that knowledge here in these two columns here, j and k. So for each sample, we can calculate the mean estimate of the sample mean. It's, it's just the sample mean, right? So we just average, average across our n samples. And then we can calculate an estimate of the um, standard deviation of the sample mean. So that is calculated by taking the sample standard deviation, so standard deviation dot s in Excel of our, of our um, randomly generated samples divided by the square root of whatever we entered as our n value. From that, since this is a normal distribution, it's really uh, simple and straightforward to calculate uh, a confidence interval from a normal distribution. So we do that over here in the columns to the left here in H and J. So for a 90% confidence interval that we entered, our upper limit is 95%. The lower limit would be 5%. And it'll calculate those automatically for you in here. And so we know that um, for a normal distribution, the confidence limit is equal to um, the mean plus um, a certain number of standard deviations away from the mean. And the way we get the number of standard deviations away from the mean is we use the Z, the Z, um, the Z value for our given confidence limit. And that Z value comes from the uh, standard normal, so norm dot S inverse uh, uh, for the confidence limit. So this is just the, the, the estimate of the mean of the sample mean plus Z, which is uh, based off of whatever percent we have here for our confidence limit times the estimate of the standard deviation of the sample mean. So that gives our upper limit. And then our lower limit is, um, you, can either, you can either do it as a plus or minus, or if you plug in um, the value for the lower confidence limit as I've done here, um, it'll take care of the sign for you. So again, it's the mean plus the Z value times um, the standard deviation. So what that gives us is it gives us three things for this one sample, right? It gives us an estimate of, um, it gives us a, a mean estimate or a best estimate of the mean, and it gives us a confidence interval on our estimate of the mean. So you can see here for this sample, the estimate of the mean is minus point, um, point one, minus point one if you round it, and the confidence, uh, the 90% confidence interval is between point one four and minus point three four. Okay, so, so we, need, we need that information to evaluate what a confidence interval means. And then the last thing we, well, second to last thing we need to do is we need to then check and ask ourselves the question, okay, does the value of the population mean that we specified in our input, does it fall in between or within our confidence interval? So in this, in this uh, column here, G, we use, in, in math, they call it an indicator function. It's a little, it's a little kind of a little trick you can use in um, Monte Carlo analysis. And so what we do here is we just check, we say, okay, if, if the um, population mean is between these two values, then that means the confidence interval contains uh, the true mean. Um, so we do that with the NIST statement, right? If it's if it's less than the upper one and greater than the lower one, then it must be in between. So we give it a one. So the indicator function is if if it's true, it's a one. 
If it's not within the interval, it's uh, a zero or essentially a, a false. So you can look here in this second row here, you can see where it's a zero. So we have our estimate of the mean is um, minus 0.26. The upper confidence limit is minus 0.01 and the lower is minus 0.5. So if our population mean is zero, that falls outside of this interval, right? So our interval didn't contain the population value, so that's a zero. Um, we then repeat this process for however many Monte Carlo realizations we think we need to start to converge to a solution. And for this demonstration, I did a thousand. That, that's, that's enough to, to get pretty close um, for, a, for a demonstration. Um, so we do that procedure, just copy down the formulas for all thousand realizations of the Monte Carlo. And then the question we're asking with confidence intervals is, um, given a set of repeated samples, so all these realizations represent our repeated samples or repeated experiments, um, in what, what percentage of those repeated samples will the confidence interval contain the true value? So this gives us a, a, a way to track that, these ones and zeros. And because we use ones and zeros, um, if we want to know what fraction what fraction of these are ones, that's the question we're asking, right? What fraction of these samples does the interval actually contain the true value? Um, we can just take an average of these, the values in this column, right? And that'll give us the fractional amount. And again, that's just like a, just one of the techniques you can use in Monte Carlo to do these types of analyses. So over here in green, we calculate that number, right? So we calculate what's the fraction of realizations where the population mean falls within our confidence interval. And if we've done everything correctly, uh, these two values should basically be the same, right? So when you calculate a confidence interval, say in this case we specified 90%, it means that if you could repeat this experiment, you know, many, 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 an infinite number of times in principle. Um, in, you know, nine out of every 10, nine out of every, every 10 times you did this experiment, your confidence intervals uh, would contain the true, the true value of the parameter, in this case, the mean. So um, that's what confidence intervals mean. That's how, that's how, you know, uh, in terms of what a repeated experiment would look like that would prove that that's what a confidence interval is. This is a demonstration of that. And again, here you can see it. So you can change these inputs, right? You could change N to, I think it'll, it'll let you do anything between 30 and 100. So you can change this number. Uh, if you want to change the confidence interval, let's say you want to calculate an 85% confidence interval, you can see it's, it's always going to practically match. It's not going to be exact because there's only a thousand realizations here. So it's, um, there's a little bit of sampling error, but it'll be it should be really close in this experiment. And if you hit F9 in Excel, it'll um, recompute on the fly for you. So you can kind of you know tinker around with these things, press F9 and see how this value in the green box changes. But you'll see that it always fluctuates a value that's pretty close to 85%, right? Or whatever you put in as your confidence interval. And uh, you know you can you can put different values for the mean, standard deviation, whatever you like, and it'll it'll you know hit F9, it'll repeat the experiment, and but it you're always going to get if you do enough realizations, you're always going to get these numbers to match, and that's essentially what a uh, that that's the the strict interpretation of what a confidence interval means. It comes from this notion of if I were to repeat my experiment. How many times would I contain the mean? And again, the reason for that is, you know, philosophically in the frequentist paradigm of probability, um, the parameters, so the mean, right? So your your S, the, the mean can't, it's not uncertain. It's a fixed value. We just don't know what it is. Um, so you can't ascribe any uncertainty to your estimate of the mean. Um, it's the confidence intervals that um, are uncertain and that vary from one um, realization to the next. And the question is, how often do they actually capture the, the true mean? Um, again, we misinterpret, you know, uh, lots of folks misinterpret these all the time. Um, and as I think I said yesterday, fortunately, um, the differences 
between confidence and credible intervals usually aren't large enough that it's going to be super impact, impactful in terms of leading us down the wrong path or leading us to an incorrect decision. But it's but it is just good to know that there is a kind of a you know in the strict sense there is a there is a difference um, in terms of how they should be interpreted. Okay, so hopefully that demo helps. This again just illustrates you know. In a, with a practical example of where they come from. Um, the other quick thing I wanted to show here is um, somebody asked about random number generators in Palisade software. So I found they have a they have a knowledge base page where they have you know you can dig into a bunch of information on their software. So um, just a little summary here. So they have a random number generator. Of course, they won't tell you what it is because they say it's proprietary, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was Mersenne Twister or something similar. A um, couple other things is they do mention here, I forget exactly where it is, but they do mention in here that they use inverse transform sampling. Um, uh, where is it in here? Find it. There it is. So the method used to generate random numbers is inverse transform, so the same method we did yesterday. It says here the exact algorithms are proprietary. So, as you saw yesterday, inverse transform. You know, it's not. Uh, it's not. Fan you know, it's not super fancy or rocket science. So, you know, you, you know what their algorithm is for inverse transform because we showed it yesterday. Um, and like I said, I, you know, I don't know exactly what they use for their pseudo random number generator, but I'm sure it's a pretty robust one. Um, another another key thing we didn't talk about yesterday that I wanted to mention real quick here is on seed values. So you you remember the simple example we did yesterday with the with the poorly performing random number generator where we had to have an initial value. So uh, pretty much all random uh, pseudo random number generators have uh, a seed. So it's basically a starting value that kicks off the random number sequence. Um, and in most software that does Monte Carlo analysis, you will have two options. One is to let the seed be selected in some way randomly. And you have a way to set the seed to a fixed value. And so when you set it um, randomly, I usually do randomly by default um, because you never want to forget that Monte Carlo has um, sampling error that we you know we touched on yesterday. So if you put a random seed in there, every time you run your Monte Carlo analysis, you're going to get a, a different answer, right? And that's okay. That's supposed to happen. Um, you just don't want the variation in those answers to be large, right? You want to have enough samples that that, that sampling error is relatively small. So I usually do that by default, but uh, the benefit of setting a fixed seed is um, repeatability, right? So if you're uh, sometimes if you're doing comparisons, you're comparing, um, you know, maybe one methodology versus another methodology. And you want to kind of eliminate any effect sampling error might have on comparing those methods. You might then want to use a fixed seed, right? So you have consistent results. The other thing is repeatable, right? If you, um, if you, you know, every time you press the button, you get the exact same answer. So that'll happen when you do a uh, fixed seed value. So um, some of our software has fixed seed by default, um, so that for that reason, right? So that you get a consistent result. Um, and anyone that runs it with the same data set will get the same result. Um, so again, that's you know that's up to you as a user, depending on your application. And like I said, pretty much all the software has you know you can choose one or the other. Um, so that was mentioned here in this in this little knowledge base article. Maybe I'll post this post this link in the chat here real quick so folks have it if you want it. Okay. So that, those are the two things I wanted to cover before we got into today's exercise. So the um, first item on the agenda today is going to be a um, Monte Carlo exercise. So you'll get to practice um, four things in this exercise. The first is just basic, a uh, really basic example just to kind of practice with the concept of inverse transform sampling. So you'll get to actually do that for a simple case. And again, Excel, uh, this RAND function is it's uniform zero to one random number generator. And you know, depending on what your software you're using, it, it'll be a different command, but um, they all have one. 
the second thing will be, or the next three things will be to solve the, the, each of the three types of problems we talked about yesterday. So the first one is optimization. So this will be fitting um, maximum likelihood estimation using Monte Carlo. So I think this is the same data set we used in the earlier exercise. So you'll be able to make some comparisons there. Um, the third one is going to be um, numerical integration. So um, in this example, this is kind of leading us towards uh, kind of a risk analysis type of calculation. So we're going to estimate the annual um, failure probability um, for using numerical, uh, you're using Monte Carlo to solve the integral. Um, and then the last one is going to be uncertainty. So it's going to be just a kind of a toy problem where we have just a simple sliding problem. So we have a, a, a block sliding on a, on a horizontal plane um, just, to keep, just to keep the calculation simple. Uh, and so we'll do it as we would determinist, deterministically with calculating factors of safety and, and um, margin of safety. And then we'll do it with Monte Carlo by making some of the parameters uh, uncertain and use that to estimate the probability of, a, say, a factor of safety less than one um, or a margin of safety less than zero. And again, this, you know, once you get the concept down, um, this method, you know, this kind of, you can expand this kind of problem, right? If you were doing a real concrete monolith and you wanted to add uplift into your calculation or, you know, maybe a passive wedge on the downstream side of the monolith or whatever it might be, right, you can, you can build upon these and build as complicated a model as you like. All you're doing is you're just adding more uh, parameters to your model, and every parameter in the model, you have the opportunity to give it an uncertainty, at least in, in conceptually the same way we're going to do in this example. So um, this will kind of lay hopefully some foundation for you for how to set up your own Monte Carlo types of analysis. So that's, that'll be it. That'll, we'll do the three types of problems and a little bit of practice. So in the first part, this was just some just some practice with doing inverse transform sampling. So there were two two steps here. One was to generate um, random numbers between zero and one using the rand function in Excel, and then plot those results and comment as to whether or not it looks like the random numbers you generated are reasonably representative of a uniform distribution, which in this case they should be. And in this, um, so random numbers between zero and one in column B using the rand function, plot those with a histogram. It looks pretty much like a um, uniform random distribution. And then um, the second column is the inverse transform sampling, where we use random numbers between zero and one to produce um, samples that have a normal distribution. Uh, with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. So uh, we can do that in one function here, right? Rand produces our random number, which we treat as a non-exceedance probability. We plug it into the um, cumulative distribution function, which in Excel is norm.inverse, and we tell it what the mean and standard deviation is for our random variable. And again, in this simple example, we just pick zero and one. Um, and then we plot that histogram and see that it does look um, Similar to, but not exactly the same as a normal distribution. I pulled in um, what the standard normal looks like with mean of zero standard deviation of one here on the right, so you can visualize it for comparison. That wasn't in the exercise, but um, you know it should have the general bell-shaped curve, the, the the middle the middle values, most likely values, the average values should be around zero, and most of the most of the values should be you know about plus or minus two. Uh, give or take. So that's just some just some basic practice with uh, with inverse um, transform sampling. Next um, next item was to do um, the optimization problem. This is the same data set we did earlier with maximum likelihood. Um, only this time we're going to use the Monte Carlo method instead of a solver to try to find the solution. So here you just had to plug in um, generating random samples for the location parameter and the scale parameter. So think of these as just making random guesses as to what they ought to be. 
Um, one thing to note when you use this method for this type of problem is you have to make sure that your um, sampling distribution cover, covers a range of where the parameters might actually live, right? So if this if this range of um, values that you're generating is too narrow, uh, you could easily miss the correct answer or the best answer, right? So um, it's one of the things that can make this a little bit of an inefficient problem to solve with Monte Carlo in that these have to be pretty wide ranges to make sure you don't miss the solution, um, at least for this type of kind of basic Monte Carlo analysis. So formula to generate random numbers. This is this is also in essence inverse transform sampling. We're generating again a uniform random number between zero and one, and then we're applying it to the cumulative distribution function for a um, uniformly distributed variable that's between uh, a lower value and upper value a and b, right? So the way we do that, the simple formula for that is a plus the random number times b minus a, and that'll give us a uniform random number between a and b, which is what we're after in this exercise for both location and scale. So the test just was to put those in, um, copy those down for uh, the number of samples we were doing, and then uh, for each of those samples, it will then look at the data values, which are up here at the top, and it will use the, the log likelihood function, very similar to the, to the one we used in the previous exercise, to calculate the log likelihood for each data value. And then over here in column A, it'll do the sum to get the total log likelihood. So same as we did in the earlier exercise, what we're trying to find is which, which combination of parameters has the highest uh, or most likely um, log likelihood value. So lots of different ways you can do this in Excel in this exercise. You can just do a search on all of the log, total log likelihoods over all the samples and find the maximum value. You can then figure out, um, at least the way this one is set up, you can then, given that maximum value, you can figure out what sample number it is uh, across your um, array of samples. And then knowing that, um, sample number, you can look up the corresponding values in the table. And of course, if you scroll down, you know, to sample 465, you can you can look at it manually and check that these that it's pulling the correct values. Uh, again, in Excel, you can hit F9 to recompute. So every time you recompute, you're going to get a different result. It's going to be a different maximum likelihood, a different sample number, and a little bit of variation in the location and the scale parameter estimate. So these would be your estimates based on the Monte Carlo. Um, you're going to get, like I said, variations depending on, on, you know, on the random number generation. Um, but you should get something in this ballpark. So a couple questions on here is, you know, how do they compare to the previous values? The previous values um, from the earlier exercise were 10.77 and 3.32. So in the same ballpark, but they are different. So the question is, why are they different? And the reason they're different, as we talked about yesterday, is due to um, sampling error. So Monte Carlo has sampling error in it. Um, it converges towards the exact solution, but it only gives you the exact solution in the limit. Um, and then so the follow-up question is, OK, if we wanted to improve our estimate uh, and still use the Monte Carlo method, how would we improve our estimate? And most of the time, the answer to that question is going to be um, that you just need to generate more samples. So we could extend this table of samples down farther, and instead of doing, I don't know, what is it, a thousand in this in this example? I think instead of doing a thousand, we could do two thousand, five thousand, ten thousand, however many we however many we want to do until we start to run into problems with having too big of a file in Excel. But you could probably get away with doing ten thousand in this example. And then you should see your um, estimates for location and scale um, improve accordingly. So that was uh, the second uh, task. Third task was to do a numerical integration. So this is a simple, a simplified version of the risk equation where we have a uh, annual exceedance probability for a flood. So we have a flood hazard curve that is defined by a normal distribution with a given mean and standard deviation. We have a um, probability of failure, a response curve, 
um, defined also with a, a mean and a standard deviation. Again, just to keep it simple so we can use some of the built-in formulas uh, and functions that are in Excel. Um, this is just a tabulation of what those would look like. You could also plot them if you wanted to. Um, so this is annual exceedance probability versus the annual maximum stage and versus um, the probability of failure given that annual maximum stage. So we combine those in the risk equation, and then we want to integrate them over all of the possible um, floods, right? So all of the AEPs. So we can do that. There's various ways to implement this in Monte Carlo. This is just one of the one of the ways. Um, and this in this way, what we're doing is we're generating um, essentially random flood events. So uh, to do that, we can do the um, random number generator between 0 and 1, which will give us a random um, non-exceedance probability for a flood event. We can then take um, 1 minus that value to get the annual exceedance probability. Now, as you get more advanced in Monte Carlo, you actually don't necessarily have to do both of these steps um, because, as it turns out, the distribution of this um, uniform random number between 0 and 1 uh, when you take 1 minus that to get the exceedance probability, the distribution of these values is also going to be a uniform random number between 0 and 1. So we could have done this in one step, but um, to be a little more formal and a little more complete, I, we did it in two steps in this exercise. Uh, and then so that gives you a, a random sample of the, of the AEP for an annual maximum flood event. Um, from that AEP, we can then um, get the stage, the corresponding stage, and we can get that um, from our distribution function since we've assumed it's normally distributed. So norm inverse, and again, in, um, in Excel notation, the probability you give it, and this is pretty standard, the probability you enter is a non-exceedance probability. So again, we have to take either 1 minus the AEP or we could have referenced column I, right, and it would have worked just the same. Um, and then the mean and the standard deviation. And then given that um, corresponding um, stage, we can then use that to get um, the probability of failure from our assumed normal distribution. So again, uh, the input this time is we're going from the variable stage to a probability. So we use the distribution, the DIST function with um, stage as the input and the mean and standard deviation of our system response curve um, as the inputs. And then we tell it true uh, because for system response curves, um, if you're familiar with reliability analysis, system response curves are essentially measures of the uncertainty in the capacity or strength of our uh, system element, whatever it might be. So uh, what that um, capacity distribution tells us is given that, um, given that, in this case, annual maximum stage, um, what's the probability that the capacity or strength of our system is less than that annual maximum stage? So uh, they're essentially cumulative distribution functions of the strength of the element or capacity of the element. So we want to use the uh, we want to pull our value from the CDF, which in Excel requires this uh, true to be in the function. So that gives our three elements of risk. Um, and, then what, and then what we can do is we've now generated um, random samples uh, of essentially the probability, the, the annual probability of failure, right? So for sample one, uh, if you kind of think of this as being sample one for this year, this would be the probability of failure, um, sample two, sample three, and, and so on. So if we want to know what the annualized probability of failure is, we can just take the average of these um, system response probability estimates over all of our Monte Carlo realizations. So that's the function that's up here. Again, there's other ways to set this up. This is, is one of the ways. Um, this is kind of the the ties back to the concept of numerical integration where we're trying to find um, essentially um, the average height of our function, right, which is our, our system response. So the average of that gives us this value. And then over here, um, for this simple type of problem, since we're using normal distributions, there, there is an exact known analytical solution and a formula for it. 
that we can calculate and compare um, to our Monte Carlo analysis to see to see how well it does against the the exact answer. So again, similar types of questions, right? Did you know what's the estimate? Um, you know, hit F9 a few times to kind of observe how things change with each run of the Monte Carlo analysis. Um, are the answers similar to the exact values? Um, for the most part, it should be yes. And again, um, if they are different and we feel like we want to improve our analysis, um, more samples is the way to go. And then the last problem type is uh, uh, propagating uncertainty through a model. So here we have a very simple model of a, a block sliding on a horizontal plane. Um, if we do it um, deterministically, we get values like this over here. We would get a margin of safety of 34,500 and a factor of safety of 1.4. So I don't know if everyone remembers, uh, remembers this from uh, Either engineering or reliability analysis. So, factor of safety is basically the um, capacity or strength divided by the load or demand, right? So, we want the strength to be higher than the load. So, we want a factor of safety greater than one. So, it's a division. And then, margin of safety is um, a um, subtraction, right? So, it's the strength or capacity minus the load. So, just two different ways to, to look at um, limit states when you're doing engineering analyses. So we get those values here, so, you know, pretty good. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, just because our factor of safety is uh, four based on our best estimates, that doesn't mean there's, you know, no chance of failure, right? So we can use Monte Carlo analysis to estimate, well, what's the, what's the probability that our um, factor of safety is actually less than one given the uncertainty in the inputs to our model, right? So our model has input that's cut and the output is factor of safety. So in this example, we just picked two of the inputs, unit weight of the concrete, put a standard deviation on that. Again, to keep it simple, assume it's a normal distribution and the friction angle at the um, contact with the foundation, simple normal distribution with the mean and a standard deviation. So to do this analysis, again, this is uh, the Monte Carlo where you, you build the model, generate a random sample of the inputs, calculate the output, and then post-process all the outputs. So in this column, we're just, again, using uniform transform sampling, generate uh, random values for the unit weight of concrete given the mean and standard deviation we have, and random samples of the friction angle. We can then plug it into the, to the equation here to get what the um, resistance is or capacity. And then we're assuming that demand is fixed. I mean, you could, in principle, put uncertainty on the demand as well. But um, normally in, the, in risk analysis, when we're estimating probability of failure, we do um, system response curves for failure modes, assuming the demand is, or I'm sorry, assuming the loading is fixed, right? And then uh, the loading uncertainty gets accounted for in the risk model. So in this case, the demand is a fixed value over here at 78,000. So for each of these um, random uh, samples of capacity, we can then compare it to the demand, again, use that indif indicator function concept, right? If capacity is less than demand, we want to give that a one. And if it's not, we want to give it a zero. And then um, probability of failure is just the average of these, um, of these um, values, right? Or you can think of it as being the count of the number of times capacity was less than demand divided by the total number of, of um, samples we generated. This is a little bit of a misnomer. It, it, it really should be probability of exceeding the limit state because just, you know, as, as if any engineers in the audience will know, just because your factor of safety is less than one does not mean that failure is guaranteed to occur, right? So this is really the probability of exceeding the limit state of a factor of safety of, of one or a margin of safety of zero. And, um, in, in a real risk analysis, this would just be one of the inputs to our um, judgment and our expert elicitation on what the probability of failure might be, right? We wouldn't necessarily um, put our full faith in this number as being the estimate of the probability of failure, because there's things that our model doesn't account for, right? There's, there's no uplift in this model. Maybe there's a passive wedge. Maybe there's 3D effects. 
et cetera, et cetera. But this does give you an indication, right, of when you might, uh, of how likely it is that you're getting into a problem area, right, when you start exceeding um, the limit state. All right, so that's the last one um, in there. So again, the error, you know, if you hit F9, you'll see the, you'll see the probability estimate change. And again, that's due to sampling error. Okay, uh, any questions in the chat? Not, not seeing any questions in the chat, so hopefully that exercise went well for everyone.